you and I, we, we've been working together in one form or another for years now. And I, the, the, the image that comes into my mind immediately is, is you um, taking saliva samples from audience members in the choir, right? And, and, or in the choir concert. So from the choir singers in the audience and even hooking us up with the performers with each EKG yeah. uh, monitors. Okay, uh, first, will you just talk about that experiment and what it was you were looking for? Well, I think something that's fascinating when we're looking at things like music and singing is that people know it's good for health. We've known it's good for health for thousands of years. Of course, over the last few decades, we've started to have really good scientific evidence showing that it's good for health. But something I've always found really intriguing is why is this happening? What are the mechanisms that are at play here? And as technology and science has advanced over the last couple of decades, we've been able to go really in depth into this. And the studies that you and I have done together are perfect examples here. We've been looking at exactly what's happening with people's heart rate variability. So very complex measures of physiological response to singing. And we've also been looking at these um, different biomarkers within saliva samples. So markers of stress, inflammation within the immune system. So together, these are giving us, giving us a sort of richer picture about how music and singing affect us. It's not just a subjective thing of we feel better, but it's that things actually physically within us are changing that can support our health. It's extraordinary. And, and what, are, what are the general findings in terms of physiology? What, what's happening in the body when one sings? Or listens well, to singing. Looking at more and more of a picture all the time. In fact, I've been working with colleagues over the last few months to look at these mechanisms. We've been trying to identify every single mechanism we know about so far, whether this is a psychological mechanism like a re reduction in anxiety or an improvement in self-esteem, or whether it's a biological mechanism like a decrease in stress hormones, a boost in immune activity, a changes in uh, levels of things like heart rate or blood pressure, or brain activity, or but also whether it might be social mechanisms, so people mm. interact that lead them to feel less lonely or behavioral mechanisms people getting out of the house or starting to experience um, healthier behaviors or behavioral activators so things that encourage them to lead healthier lives and we've identified over 600 of these mechanisms so far so the way that the music affects us is not simple it's incredibly complex and it's interesting i think people have often been a bit suspicious about music as in how is it that um singing it can make you feel better, but it can also completely transform your life. We have people who can join a choir and it can totally turn around their mental health, their social behaviors. It can even change their career path, everything they're doing. And I think people have been um, almost distrustful of this. They found it a bit suspicious because you wouldn't expect the same disproportionate response from a drug, let's say. But actually when we think about the volume of mechanisms that are being activated at once, it starts to make sense about why music is so powerful. So you can, you can actually see in the data that, that not only physiological, uh, these data points, but, but sociological data points, they're all being affected by those people who are singing together. Exactly. I mean, if the challenge is we can't measure all 600 in every study. So what you often find is that studies will narrow down into just one or two of these to understand that particular pathway in more detail, or they might start to see how some of these things interact. Because if we start to sing more, and we meet more friends, then that might help to boost our confidence. And that boost of confidence might mean that we try another activity. So these things are interconnected. It's incredible. But you've been able to tease out of the data, let's talk just physiological for a moment. You've actually been able to tease out of the data these actual physical changes that are happening in the body. And can you describe that so like in terms of hormone levels, in terms of blood pressure? So for example, the studies that we did with you with this uh, singing, we were very interested in stress hormones like cortisol, which is one of the prime stress hormones in our body. And what we found was that singing can lead to reductions in levels of stress hormones. So as well as people feeling less stressed, they are biologically less stressed. And this is key because high levels of stress hormones are linked in with a whole range of mental and physical health conditions. But what was interesting was we found some nuance here. It's been a good example of a study where we zoned in in quite a lot of depth because we found that this was only happening when people were relaxed and singing for more of the fun of it. When we put people in front of an audience of 700 others, we actually found an increased their stress level. Of so course. It's amazing to hear that it's not, it doesn't always mean that music or singing works the same way in every context. It turns out that there, the stressful experience of being literally in the spotlight probably overrode the uh, relaxation effects that people had had when they were just singing to one another. Yeah, I remember this, that we, we, you also tested this during one of the rehearsals. And I think there was even this, this, you were able to see through data alone, the first read through of the piece, 
right? Where, where stress levels tended to be high. And then as we got more comfortable with the piece, is that right? That it, yes, we you found saw it that in the body. Yes, exactly. That's incredible. And, and so then I don't remember, but, but within the performance itself, was there also, uh, you know, a, a diminishment of the, of say cortisol in, in the body? In the high stress performance, there was an increase in cortisol. But I think what we hypothesized here is it was quite likely to decrease quite quickly afterwards. And just to, like certain amounts of stresses are good for us. Sometimes we talk about it as uh, actually uh, increases in stress means that we're ready to perform because cortisol, as well as being a stress hormone, uh, one, one of its uh, evolutionary purposes was to make us more alert. We typically got higher levels of it in stressful situations where you then need to have all of your mental faculties ready. You need to have blood pressure at a good strength. You need to be focusing your body physically onto the most important things. And that's one of the reasons that people can often remember performances in amazing clarity when they've done a performance because they were so mentally alert. Oh, wow. So in fact, and it could be a, a hormonal change in the body that's causing that alertness or is it a hormonal change? Pretty much everything that you feel will have been due to some kind of uh, biological change in your body just in life generally. So it's really fascinating to start to understand what, why that's happening, what is happening in biologically, chemically within your body to make you feel those things. I've often had this experience. I don't know if you've had it, it singing or if you've had it even in your own work, this, this kind of flow state where mm -hmm. I'll be on stage and time seems to stop. Like I, it's, it's the only way to describe it. And it's, it's looking back on it, it's never a state of bliss. I'm, I'm never, I never feel this sense of ecstatic joy or deep sorrow, I simply am. And, yes. and my God, would I love to find that in my daily life. Do you know, like, how do you find that, that magical, mystical moment from a stage and apply it? Do you think that, that eventually there's, a, there's, there's the right cocktail of, of hormonal balance and sociological balance in your own daily life where you could find that, that moment? Do you know what I mean? We'd all love to know the secret. Right. <laughs> I think what you described is flow. That's one of these mechanisms that I mentioned, the 600 or so that we've identified so far. That is one of the mechanisms by which um, activities can have, arts activities can have health benefits. And I think the, the way that has come to a lot of prominence recently, it's an older concept, but it's come into prominence with mindfulness a lot over the last few years. The idea that you can get yourself completely focused on what you are doing right then, not thinking about anything else in the world. Now, what's interesting with mindfulness is I know a lot of people, including me, if they try to be mindful, it's a total disaster. I've tried every app or technique or whatever, but my mind's just always racing with ideas. But I find that there are certain activities that for me make me be mindful. So for me, music is one of them. Playing the piano is one of my ways of being in that flow moment that you described. Gardening is another. So I think for people who find mindfulness hard, creative activities are a very natural form of mindfulness. An activity. That's that's it exactly. And and so you, you mentioned gardening. Do you see that as a creative outlet? Very much so. There's been a lot of debate about things like gardening, cookery and baking about are they art forms? But I think they are because I think when I think about arts, I think about creativity. And I think that anything that's involving imagination or it is involving developing a new product. I mean, when you grow a seed from scratch into a plant in the garden, you are making something just like you are if you're painting or doing a uh, sculpture and you're creating beauty at the same time. And it takes imagination to know how you're planting things, what design you're going for in your garden as well. So for me, it's very much an arts activity. Isn't it amazing? So it, you said this word imagination that at the, at the end of the day, it's somehow this, it, I, I always imagine my, my mind as a computer, right? That I've only got so much CPU. There's just only so much power. That, and that if I'm involved in an activity, like say, for instance, if I'm playing Bach and you've got both hands and several lines of counterpoint, that completely taxes all the CPU that I have. And there's no space anymore for the ego or for, for self, right? That you, you feel that sense of selflessness. And I wonder in your own work as a scientist, do you also have these, are there moments of focus that are so intense that are, that are unrelated, say, to gardening, to music, like, like a typical art form, but, but to that creative mind where you find yourself in that state of flow as well? Absolutely. For me, it's uh, particularly doing statistical coding. It's a kind of computer coding that you do. And you get very into it because if you make mistakes, the whole thing stops working. So it's all about complete focus and precision and working things through logically, sort of solving maths problems. 
So yes, I think this is something you can achieve, not just through the arts, but through other activities. But in fact, what you mentioned there about that sense where you've used up your CPU, as you put it, that's actually one of the other mechanisms that is, is known to link arts with health. Um, this is particularly one that affects pain. So there's a lot of research about how engaging in the arts can reduce levels of pain, whether that's mothers singing during labor or whether that's uh, people who are listening to music before or after surgeries. Um, and uh, the reason we think this happens is something called the gate theory of pain, which is that exactly as you described, there's only so much bandwidth you've got. So therefore, if you're using up that bandwidth with certain stimuli like music, for example, it can reduce the amount of bandwidth that will focus on things like pain sensations. So it's literally diverting your attention away. And by, by reducing your perception of pain, mm -hmm. in a way, you're actually reducing the pain itself, right? Because yes, exactly. th that's extraordinary. I mean, isn't, that, isn't that amazing that the human body works that way? It's fantastic. But that's another example Like people have anecdotally reported music and pain for ages. But we now are getting to the level we understand exactly why that's happening. So it's much greater scientific precision. Yeah, I find this, this also amazing that probably since the, the dawn of man, there's been some form of, of singing and singing together in groups. And that you, I feel like we can look back at it now, even with all the science that we have behind it, and see the wisdom in doing it, right? I, I often think I'm not a religious person, but I think that, say, Christian churches for century, for centuries have been millennia actually coming together and singing as a group and there's, yeah. there's there's probably just a very obvious physiological bonding chemical bonding that's happening between right it, the data yeah. shows this the data shows this exactly so uh, for example one of the hormones is something called oxytocin which it's a, it's a neurotransmitter and it, it's involved in social bonding and we see that there have been a number of studies showing that oxytocin increases when people are singing together and there are other markers as well, endorphins, for example, which are increased mm. through singing, which are also involved in this bonding process. So yes, again, this is another perfect example. We know anecdotally, we know psychologically, socially, but we also know biologically that these activities help to bond us. It's beautiful, right? It's this, this kind of internal mechanism that, is, that seems to be inherent in, in our bodies, in our minds. It, it's, I, I just always think, you know, for me, of course, um, being a musician and being involved in singing, I, I always think in terms of advocacy that, that I'd like to just go to say school districts and say, you should simply be starting every day with singing. Every, the whole rest of the day is going to go better. The, the, right? the sense of empathy, compassion, the, the way students bond together, the focus, it's- You um, don't even have to go and say that. It should be, it used to be innate. It used to be just what we did. But what we've seen to have evolved over the last couple of centuries into not focusing on these things which just seem so fundamental to our existence as a species but also to things like our mental health and we know you know if we look back sort of i'm, I'm going into much softer science here but if we look back into our pre-ancestors then we we start to get a much better sense of the things they did that were obviously essential to survival and one of them was being in groups and yet so much of the time now people don't get together in groups things are being done Virtually, I realize this is the worst possible time to be saying that given we're all being <laughs> um, but, but all these things that, and you know, exercise, just fundamentally being outside a lot of the time, being with nature a lot of the time, engaging in group rituals, particularly things like music and dance. These have been with us since the, the very, very early stages of, of human life. So they shouldn't be things that we have to argue to be part of education or whatever. They should be just taken as essentials like eating and breathing. Yeah, absolutely. So then I remember it, continuing with your studies that, that we did together, you, uh, as part of the, I think it was the last virtual choir, there was a pretty extensive questionnaire that was sent out to all of the, the, the yeah, singers who, yeah, and I remember the, the big splashy headlines after it came out were, is, is, virtual, is singing in a virtual choir good for your health, right? I, I love how the, how the media always <laughs> finds, finds these headlines. But, but what did the data show? But I love this study because when we published it, it got quite a lot of media attention, but it was a pretty niche concept, virtual. <laughs> you, know, you had so much fast with it, but it wasn't really mainstream. But suddenly this paper has had thousands of downloads over the last few weeks because suddenly virtual anything. Really, is, even just over the last few weeks? Yeah, over the last few weeks. It's hilarious. So we actually uh, were very uh, forward thinking in doing this study. So what we, what we particularly were interested in was do virtual choirs have the same kind of health benefits as live choirs? 
and it, it's particularly relevant given people aren't really together so this kind of social isolation is, is part of it um, and because it's it's a, it's a different it's a reinvention of the concept of the choir it's not just a different version it's a reinvention so um, we compared people who took part in your virtual choir uh, with people who'd taken part in another study about the same time which asked about live singing and we were interested in their emotional responses and their physical social responses to the, to the engagements and what we found was that people who sang in virtual choirs compared to people in live choirs actually had very similar emotional experiences they felt that it almost to the same degree it helped them to distract them from their worries or stresses and it also helped them to confront those worries whether through cathartically venting negative emotions or through actually sort of reappraising things using the time and space of singing to think about their lives differently there was slightly lower in the virtual choirs compared to the live choirs but really not very much and interestingly we actually found that the virtual choirs increased people's sense of self-esteem and confidence more than the live choirs now this might sound a bit bizarre but actually if you think about it it does make sense and that if you're in a virtual choir no one else can hear you singing out of tune i guess because you <laughs> you can decide which video you are then happy with if it gets uploaded there's also the sense that you've created that product you've got your video of yourself singing that you can be proud of almost like an artwork and that's something that's much harder with live singing which is such a transient experience um, the, however there was a kind of caveat to all of this which is we also asked people how socially present they felt and we found there was huge variability here so some people felt just as socially present as if they were in a live choir whereas others found that it was just they just didn't feel there so it clearly works for some people more than others and we're not quite sure why that is at the moment uh, but I think and we did find that there was a link between this sense of social presence and your emotional response. So in other words, if you could buy into it, get into the spirit, you could benefit pretty much as much as a real choir. But if, if it didn't work for you, then it just didn't work for you. Uh, that's really interesting. You know, it, it's, it's so telling what you say, because the obviously the mechanism of making a virtual choir from the individual's point of view, it, it couldn't be further from actually singing with, with a choir, right? I, it, in that... You, you know, you talked about hearing that in a choir, you're worried about singing bad in a traditional choir, but actually with the virtual choir, the spotlight is so heavy on you because you don't have the, the cloud cover of all of the people singing around you. It's just you alone. And, and there are very few singers on earth who just sound great singing an alto line on their own. Do you know what I mean? It's really difficult. And especially the way I compose, it's, these are always my pieces. They're, the lines are always too long for one breath. So you've got to sneak a breath somewhere and then when you have to listen back to that, I, I, I feel like I, I'm asking a lot of the singers in terms of just have faith that you're going to do this very um, artificial thing and then upload it. And then in a month and a half, it will actually, it will be the thing. But this time around and based on, on uh, in part on, on your study, we really embrace this idea of, of creating a culture of, of social interaction. So we've got a very, very, yeah, we've got a very active Facebook group now and, and people, I, I had some online rehearsals where just like this, I was, I, but even without like looking at your face here on, on camera, I'm just talking to the ether and seeing people's comments go and, and hoping that as I'm playing and singing along that other people around the world are playing. But the overwhelmingly, the response has been in a poetic way, people saying, I feel like I'm part of this. Like I'm, I'm actually part of this family and, and it feels so good to sing with other people again, even though of course they're not literally singing with other people. Well, that's really great. And everything you've described sounds fantastic. It's almost like moving it forward to the next version of virtual choirs. And I think we should see more of this over the next few years because in response to what's happening now, I think people are gonna be even more keen to look at these virtual digital options of connecting and of singing. So I'm not surprised that people are starting to feel more of a community if these extra things have been brought in. I think what's interesting there is that often when we look at virtual or digital engagements, a lot of it looks at things like virtual reality, where you've got a full headset, you feel completely in the world around you. And something I did find fascinating from our study is that people could feel very present, even with a pretty low tech option of you know, their laptop or bedroom. So you didn't need a lot of high tech equipment. It seems that even without that, people really could buy in. Yeah, that this this to me I marvel at, and it's it's there's there is this again an, an inherent 
uh, need to connect with people, right? It's so deep and so fundamental that I think people can take just, just the, the smallest skeleton or framework of actually communicating with each other and, and have a, a genuine bonding experience. I'm, 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 the thing that just popped into my head was, um, you'll hear about prisoners, right, who are in isolation and teach themselves Morse code so that they can click on the pipes and speak to other prisoners, right? Like the, the people, uh, people adapt in such incredible ways. And as you say, in the most lo-fi ways, but then seem to be having a communal experience. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think we, we are very adaptive as a species. And I think I'm particularly interested to see what happens with the art sector over the coming months. Because I think across countries globally, we're seeing this huge shakeup and we're about to witness, I think, a devastating loss of many arts organizations. But I, I believe in the creativity of artists to rebuild from the ashes, so to speak. I don't think it's gonna be easy. I think it's gonna be painful and really difficult, but I'm really fascinated to see what emerges as the new arts and cultural scene, because it can't go back to the way it was before. We're going to have to be looking at elements at least of reinvention. And I'm so interested to see what emerges as, as the new norm within arts. Yeah, me too. It's, and, and like you, I'm just, every day I see some new application of technology in order to, to make these things happen. And it, it yeah, the, the, the capacity for human invention is breathtaking. Um, so speaking of that, in terms of, of the arts and the future of arts, uh, I know right now that you're, you're very, very involved with, with the COVID crisis and specifically research, yes, and, and its, its potential applications. It, looking forward, and let's, let's talk very specifically about singing for a moment, <laughs> because singing, it seems to be getting a lot of bad press lately, literally singing, right? You hear about these horrible, um, these tragic events that have happened in choirs, right? That, that, that a single person in a choir singing with a group of people has potentially infected 60 or 70 people and had some deaths in the choir. Is, is there even a, a prediction or a, a specul speculative prediction about where all of this is going? When we'll be back to singing? It's really hard to say, and because we haven't faced a virus like this before, um, and also because it's not just dependent on the science of it, but of course on the political decisions of those in decision-making roles. So I think it's really difficult to, to predict that. Some, something that I think it is likely to happen though is that people will engage more and more with these digital singing groups. And I, I'm confident we will get back to being able to do those group singing things. But at the moment, it's very hard to put a date on that to know when yeah. it's going to be and, and whether it's going to be something we're phasing in and out of or before it returns to being fully available almost as before. Yeah, it's, it, and it's for a non-scientist like myself, but maybe an armchair scientist, you know, I, I love to read scientific articles and, and be as, as, um, informed as possible. Even now, it seems like it's all over the map in terms of just what we know about the virus itself, right? Like I, I keep thinking, well, it's, if I understand the science correctly, there's simply no way you could safely get a group of people together in a room until there's either herd, herd immunity or I suppose this, this mythical vaccine, if it ever even exists or will do its job completely. It, yeah, it's, it's, I, I guess what I'm saying is that I think for most of the general public, maybe just like you, this, the science seems incomplete and sometimes uh, it's just hard to understand what's actually happening. I mean, I think what, what is happening is the speed of science is like nothing I've ever seen before. So behind the scenes, I think we, at the public side, you only tend to see the kind of massive headlines. So it might feel like we're all just waiting for a miracle vaccine that's going to just emerge one day. But behind the scenes, it's just an absolute hive of activity across every domain, whether this is understanding about how the virus works or how to treat it or how to vaccinate against it, but also understanding the behavioral elements about how people are behaving, what's predicting their behaviors, and also about the psychological toll and social toll of this, what's happening to mental health, who's at risk, what things are buffering against this. So I'm working on the psychological and social impact of the pandemic. Um, I'm running a, a massive study in the UK of over 70,000 adults who are taking part every week in, in data collection. 
So we're getting real time data about how people are responding and no study like this has ever been carried out before. So the sheer volume of data and the speed at which we're getting it and analyzing it is just unbelievable. Wow. So I think something I would just say is not to worry that scientists are sitting back in the background waiting for a breakthrough. There are papers coming out every hour of the day uh, yeah. at the moment. So it's just unbelievably busy. But with science, I think the thing that I know it took, I was quite surprised at when I started my career in science was that everything is done through tiny incremental advances one by one. We tend to hear about what we hear as big breakthroughs. But the truth is every big breakthrough builds on masses of incremental studies getting up to that point. So we need the sheer volume of studies coming out and we need these day by day, these daily achievements and progresses to get us there. And that, that is happening. Amazing. I, I read yesterday in the Washington Post, it was, the headline was something like one third, it's estimated that one third of all citizens in the US are experiencing some form of anxiety disorder or clinical depression right now. And I, I wonder if that even resonates at all with the studies that you're doing in the UK. And are you seeing that those kinds of numbers because of this? It's really hard to work out prevalence because the truth is, is that if you actually want to know the precise proportion of a population that's, for example, depressed, um, there's, the only way to do that is through a random postcode sample. So you're literally sampling households randomly across the whole country. Now, that's, that is a very expensive and complicated thing to do. So what tends to happen is this gets done every few years in what we call a cohort study. So, for example, in the UK, we, we're very good at setting these up. So we've set up a number of studies in the last few decades that, for example, track every single baby born in one week um, across the whole country for every few years for the rest of their lives. So those give you genuinely random samples. Yeah. Now, uh, what we tend to get in the meantime, because those are big studies that, I mean, they are in the UK, they're mobilizing now, they're now collecting data, but it's taken a few months to get to that stage uh, because they're such big machines. So what you tend to hear about in the media are often sort of surveys where they surveyed 2000 people who are, you know, just like the population, they'll be split on gender and there will be a mix of ages and they can give you a rough estimate. Um, and, and certainly from the study we're doing, we're, we're very, we call it well stratified. We've got every group well covered and we, we statistically manipulate our data so it represents the pop proper population of the UK. Uh, and certainly we are seeing that mental health seems to be worse than normal. It seems to have got worse in the lead up to lockdown coming in and then seems to have sort of plateaued but not really improved very much since. Um, so we're getting good sense of this and I think it's true to say that many people are being badly affected, particularly people who have a history of mental illness for which it means that they you know, that this might be triggering things in a particularly bad way for them, but also people who might have fewer socioeconomic resources, yeah, therefore sure. they might be experiencing more adversities, and also young people. Young people seem to be being disproportionately badly affected by everything right now, perhaps because their lives have just been so turned upside down. Yeah, it's, it's you know, it, it, it's interesting, you're, you're speaking about like, let's like say this Washington Post headline, and then probably it's based on a small sampling and maybe it gives a very rough idea. Do you find yourself as a scientist, is it something that as a person you've had to discipline yourself about that, um, that to, to ignore the, the, these screaming headlines and simply just, just always go back to the data? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I'll be honest, I've had so many papers that have been hyped up by the time it's got to press so whenever i see any scientific paper reported uh, in the media i always just go back to the actual paper itself look at their data look at what they're actually saying and a lot of media reporting of science is very good uh, but media is often about headlines so they'll go for the juiciest thing the things that look the most outrageous and saying that things are okay or look a bit stable probably isn't isn't that interesting that's why you tend to sort of hear the best or the worst um, so I think, I think I'd always say take the headlines with a bit of a pinch of salt if they sound particularly sensationalist. But like I said, that there, is, there is also some very good media reporting of science from, from certain outlets. Um, so sometimes you can get really nicely done summaries of studies. And I think we're seeing this more and more as well with blogs online. There are lots of organizations now who are using scientists or people who've got science training to actually uh, blog about results in, in a sort of more friendlier language because our papers are often a bit dense and boring to read but uh, so I think there's a lot of resources out there for people who actually want to sort of see what's coming through in scientific papers in a bit more depth. So good to hear. Daisy Fancourt, thank you so much. It's, it's always a pleasure to talk to you and thank you truly for all the work that you're doing right now. Not at all, it's a pleasure.
<laughs> Take care. All right.